Oh, hello, good evening. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live from a news about Desawe Kanda, also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279. We're all across the world on 3news.com. Coming up tonight, Labour stands its grounds to embark on a nationwide demonstration should government fail to yield to their demands on dealing with illegal mining. We'll stay on this matter and more as part of our campaign against illegal mining. Lot. There's a number of developments. Which we are sinking at into tonight. And also, the Christian Council of Ghana and other key stakeholders, the columns of the eminent persons group, they are calling for a truce between the National Democratic Congress, NDC, and the Electoral Commission of Ghana, impressing on the disputed parties to resolve the issues about the voters register amicably. They want a dialogue. And also, the UK minister in charge of Africa, Lord Collins has also been talking to me about the need for this development, about the issues of mistrust to be addressed, especially for the development of our democracy as a country. We'll get into it here on your election command center. Also tonight, it appears the electricity company of Ghana, ECG, is in critical condition as the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, that's the regulator of the ECG, they're already warning of a possible bankruptcy of the power distribution company. We've got details of the PRC statement. There are some recommendations they make. we we'll run it across some persons and stakeholders within the power sector to find their thoughts. This is Ghana Tonight. As always, you're an integral part of the conversation. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and on X. Let's get talking. I haven't seen this uh, viral video of a senior high school teacher who was beaten to pulp by the students for, for what we are hearing, not allowing them to cheat in, in the exam hall. Well, the, this teacher who was assaulted by the students is going to be joining us tonight to tell his story. So stay with us here on Ghana tonight. We would have Walter Yesuto Adanunyo, who is a teacher at the Christian Methodist Senior High School here in Accra to tell exactly what happened that led to the students pelting him with stones, beating him to pop what we're seeing in that viral video. But stay with us here on your election command center. Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. The Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, PRC, says Ghana's power sector is under imminent threat due to the financial instability of the electricity company of Ghana. In a letter to the presidency, the PRC warns fiscal discipline and a directive barring the ECG from engaging in encore activities to ensure the company's survival. The Savannah Regional Security Council has initiative operations in mining communities along the Black Volta to address illegal miners who have taken over the river. People have gone to destroy our natural water bodies. I tell you that the number of chamfans we have burnt is nowhere closer to the number of chamfans that are still on the rivers, and they, they are at least five kilometers away from the river. The conveners of Democracy Hub, organizers of the Fix the Country and Occupy Jubilee House demonstrations are yet to agree on a convergence point with a pleas on their planned demonstration over illegal mining, announcing a three-day protest starting on Saturday, September 21. The group demanded governance reforms to put an end to illegal mining, Galam say. We are not just calling for an end to illegal mining. We are calling for the resignation of those who have allowed this crisis to fester. We demand the immediate resignation of the following officials. The Minister for Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation. The Minister for Lands and Natural Resources. The heads of the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. The Minerals Commission and the Forestry Commission. These are the individuals who have 
to protect our environment. The Institute of Economic Affairs Presidential Debate and Evening Encounter Series, set to commence on Wednesday, September 18, has been called off. This is as a result of leader of the new force, Nana Kwame Bediakon, withdrawing from the exercise. Flag bearer of the NPP, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, has assured residents of Sege of constructing a sea defense for them when he wins power. He also pledged to construct a harbor and the setting up of an automatic dispensing machine for pre mixed fuel for fisher folks at Sege. Dr. Mahmoud Baumia was interacting with the residents as part of his Community Connect event. In Sege, the fishermen want pre mixed fuel. So we want to establish automatic dispensing digital machine for premix here in, in Sege. We need a mini harbor here. We need a mini harbor. So we are going to work on bringing a mini harbor to Sege here for you. So that is a very, very important thing. As money is on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, more calls, growing calls for uh, the consideration of the NDC's issues with the credibility of the voters register and also the position of the electoral commission as stated there's been that call for a dialogue to be considered to resolve their differences about the voters register now the latest to join in it's uh, the eminent persons group they've issued a statement under the umbrella of the christian council of ghana uh, as well on this but this is your election command center Well, after the demonstration by the, the, sorry, the nationwide demonstration by the NDC yesterday, now that's led to the increased and continuous conversation about what has to be done to address the concerns that they raise for the credibility of the electoral roll going into this election also to be, to be rest assured and reassured, not just for the NDC, but for the other like-minded persons and groups that joined the demonstration and have spoken so far about it. The Christian Council of Ghana is calling on the Electoral Commission to a broader consultation of stakeholders and ensure transparency in its processes ahead of the 2024 December elections. And as a statement that they issued, um, also together with the eminent persons group, they all came together to issue this statement, which we got a copy of earlier today. The Christian Council and the eminent persons group are saying this will cultivate confidence and trust in the commission for the elections. I'm just going to show you portions of this statement that came through earlier today and take a look at this. They say that the Electoral Commission, through her actions and inactions, has faced many accusations leading to the loss of confidence and heightened levels of mistrust in the conduct of Ghanaian elections, especially from parties in opposition. And nonetheless, the 2024 polls are being conducted under intensified skepticism, particularly due to concerns raised by the main opposition party, the NDC, regarding the voters' register and related issues. They continue. They are calling on the Electoral Commission to elevate her consultations and participatory methods and ensure increased transparency and improved communication with stakeholders. And take a look at that. The, the, the recommendation there is increased transparency and improved communication with stakeholders to cultivate confidence and trust. These are the two crucial ingredients in any electoral process that certainly must be upheld. Now, this is especially significant 
in this crucial election year. And that's what, how they conclude um, the statement, portions of it that we received earlier today with the Christian Council of Ghana and the eminent persons as well, eminent persons of Ghana who signed this statement. And let's stay a bit further on this. Dr. Togbi Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklo is a statesman. He is a founding member of the New Patriotic Party. He's joining us on Zoom for a conversation. Togbi, I appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. We saw the demonstration yesterday. The Electoral Commission has also responded. The position is quite clear on this. Beyond the demonstration and what has been happening now, what should be the next step of consideration in addressing the issues that have come up, just in the interest of sustaining the trust and confidence in the electoral process? I think, uh, firstly, it's unfortunate that we've got to this uh, position at the moment. And what is happening now to me, it's not a question about the NDC, but it's a national issue, and we have to be very careful. Um, I said so because we've seen something like this before in this country. Um, or it happened in other countries around us. Now, the voters was supposed to be a peaceful one. But what happened in Kumasi is a very, very important statement. The police cannot suppress the masses. I repeat, the police cannot suppress the masses. They might be able to control them to a certain extent. And also, if we are not careful, and this gets into a serious uprising, which is possible, let me warn this nation, which is very possible, And when we are in serious crisis, then we are walking into the hands of the military. And if we walk into the hands of the military, I think the people of this country will regret forever. But it is unfortunate that as I speak now, we have elders in this society, senior statesmen, both in my party, the MPP and other political parties and nobody is saying a word. We have also other respected citizens in this country. They are all quiet. When we get to that deadly level, I think that is the time that they will realize that it was necessary for them to have said something else. Now, I noticed that there were few representatives from other political parties in the protests. That is important. The concerns of all the political parties must be seen to by the Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission is not above the laws of this country. They are not. And what really disturbs me is that I listened to a gentleman from my party defending the indefensible. You can see clearly from his statement that the EC has committed an error and they are not willing to correct it. An error with our call was deliberate. And if, if it had not been dictated by the NDC, we would have had a different results after the election. I have said time and again that when a political party will win an election in any civilized country, you, you see it. And we have to be careful. I once again appeal to Jim Mensah that she should be careful. She should make sure 
the concerns and demands of these political parties are met by the EC. But if she's not careful, she will walk this country into destruction. It can happen. Years ago, we thought there could not be a problem in Liberia. I remember vividly. When trouble came to Liberia, uh -huh. we all knew how it was. So once again, I would like to appeal to the East because all she has to do is to allow the forensic audit. Simple. Simple. If she prevents to do that, that will convince all thinking Ghanaians that she's hiding something. But, but there appears, uh, Toby, the, the ACE's position is quite clear on that call for an audit. They have indicated that the exhibition ex exercise itself was a corrective measure that identified some of these issues. And so that call really is not necessary as against the issues that the NDC has raised. So the position is quite clear. But then again, there's, there's been that talk for dialogue, and that's where this recent call is, is increasing now. And, and I want to find out your thoughts on that, especially because of the positions that we have heard on this matter going forward. No, quite recently, an institution that I have always been thinking they should be the first when we have such crisis coming up, are the religious group. Some of them even started talking about what is happening in the country just yesterday. They should be the first. Now, what is happening now, we have to be careful. I keep on saying I keep on saying that because we don't know how it will end. And the best way to avoid crisis is to prevent crisis from coming. Now, the religious bodies are there. The TUC has come out with a strong statement. Indeed, today, they have added more demand. And I don't believe any sane government will sit down on concert. The churches, as I said earlier on, the trade union, various organizations, and particularly the young people of this country. If they want to lead this country or be around and this country is led into destruction, that is left to them. That is left to them. Because if we joke with what is happening now, what started today, what started today is a serious, very, very serious signal. And I will be surprised if it's not taken seriously by any sane politician, and for that matter, any other person in this society, and the youth in particular. It shouldn't be just a protest, it's a signal. If we are not careful, it will lead us into a situation that will be worse than June 4. I saw June 4. I saw it with my naked eye. So I think this is all that I'll do. And uh, th those words, as brief as they are, is enough to carry a, a message as you have presented it. And I, and I do appreciate your time. Um, thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Tawi, Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklo. And in fact, today, the NDC in the Ashanti region also issued a statement. And that's what Tawi, Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklo has been referring to uh, what happened earlier today with respect to the NDC's position on, on, the, on the developments. And we're putting part of the incident on the screen right now um, that characterize some skirmishes in that region yesterday they say they are denying the police statement that
they, they, they attacked the, the police personnel there. That did not happen. Um, they rather would also in their statement indicate that their supporters rather were manhandled by the Ghana Police Service personnel who were deployed to guard the protesters during that demonstration yesterday. So that's the position put out earlier today uh, by the NDC in the Ashanti region. And it's one that we're keeping an eye on to see how things play out here on your election command center. But there's been a number of references made to the trust and confidence in the Electoral Commission. And this is what we saw. Comparing two, at least two data points, so we know. So those of you who would have positions about a particular survey and the outcome of it. Now, here's what we do. If you don't want to trust just one poll, look at two or three of them. Trust in the Electoral Commission and the courts, the Ghana Police Service, plummeted to unprecedented low levels, at least in the Afrobarometer survey uh, that was released sometime last year. It surveyed between the years 1998 all the way to the year 2022. And I'm going to take you through it. Take a look at this. Follow me closely. Now, in the year 1998, according to the Afrobarometer survey, the Electoral Commission enjoyed a trust level of 63%. In the year 2022, it dropped to 2,000, it, it dropped to 49%. In the year 2002, 49%. Now, in 2006, prior to the 2008 elections, when the Afrobarometer survey was conducted, the Electoral Commission enjoyed a trust level of 75%. It then dropped to 67% in the year 2009. And I want you to track the years. Every time after the a major election, for instance, in 2008, you see that, that decline. And, and watch this. In the year 2013, there was another survey. In fact, in 2012, we saw another decline to 59%. Then in 2014, just after the 2012 elections, we saw a further decline to 37%. And between 2014 and 2018, when the other survey was conducted, there was an increase of 54% in the confidence level for the Electoral Commission. Now, between 2018 and to 2020, prior to the 2020 elections, the Electoral Commission enjoyed a confidence level of 52%. Now, in 2022, when the Afrobarometer survey conducted its round nine, they saw a decline as well in the trust in the Electoral Commission, dropping to 33%, an all-time low. That was two years ago, proud to the selection as we're going into it. Now, there's going to be another Afrobarometer survey that's going to be released in the coming week. So we'll keep an eye on that. But as of 2022, the trust in the Electoral Commission per the Afrobarometer survey was 33% as all-time low. Now, that's not the only one. The Global Info Analytics has also been doing some surveys, doing comparative analysis month on month. In the month of April, this year, 2024, that's the survey details represented with the green bar and the month of July survey details represented with the blue bar. In the month of April, when they went onto the, on, onto the street across the country, surveying almost 8,000 respondents, 59% of the respondents in April said they had confidence in the electoral commission. Now guess what, in July, this was just two months ago, when they went onto the streets again, sampling the same size, they had 53% of the respondents saying that they had confidence in the Electoral Commission. That's a drop. But if you compare that to those in April who said they had no confidence in the Electoral Commission, that was 32%. But then in July, it was an increase to 38%. So you see clearly that comparative analysis in terms of the month for month and how things are playing out for the commission in terms of the trust and confidence that citizens and electorates have for them. And those who say they have no opinion, about 9% of, of them. Now, when I sat earlier with the UK minister in charge of Africa, 
Lord Collins. He also had some thoughts about what has to be done to improve the confidence and trust in the Electoral Commission going into this crucial election. Take a look. I think, as I said, I've spoken to uh, the candidates. They're all committed to that process. They've all, you know, uh, everyone wants to be reassured about processes. Um, but I think actually the most important thing is that they uh, speak to each other about the sort of standards that they want uh, to see achieved. And I think that dialogue is really important. So the mechanisms for achieving that through the Electoral Commission, uh, the National Peace Commission, those things, setting standards for democracy to work fairly are really important. But everyone has to have confidence in that. And I'm confident that the two candidates and the major political parties will focus on achieving that fair election. Because whatever the outcome, uh, you know, Ghana needs to focus in the longer term uh, with a government that has that mandate. And the fairness and transparency is key. Of course it is in any election, but I think that can only be, that can be best achieved uh, with dialogue between the major parties because, uh, you know, it's, I think they both cherish the democracy that Ghana's been able to uh, establish uh, and embed and I think that's the important key to the future. The short-term focus of some of the promises you have heard as well, it is, is, is that a challenge to our democracy from where you see it? Well, I think it's a challenge for all democracies. Uh, I don't think Ghana's unique, and I think that's why, you know, I will no doubt meet uh, the President of Ghana at the General Assembly of the United Nations, where the whole agenda is focused on the, that future generation. And also, I mean, the agenda is how do we actually sort of deliver on the goals set out in the uh, sustainable development goals in the 2030 agenda? 2030 is not that far away now. Uh, and those targets are really uh, important to achieve to lay the foundations for the future. And that was a 15 year agenda now, you know, electoral cycles, uh, you know, can sort of take your eye away from those longer term things. But I think when a government does something that works and delivers for its people, then all political parties can support it. I mean, in the United Kingdom, we established a national education system, we established a welfare state, we established all of those things have become embedded. And most political parties are now debating on not whether we have them or we don't have them, but how we improve upon them. And that's the sort of debate that I'm sure Ghana will have for the future. As Lord Collins, a UK Minister in charge of Africa there earlier today when I sat with him, a number of issues coming up. And then also the, the recommendations he makes about what has to be done to safeguard the democracy that we're, we're experiencing or practicing as a country going into this election. This is your election command center. Uh, coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, we are in the northern part of the country where a security operation has led to the confiscation of equipment belonging to illegal miners. And guess what? We've seen this every time when the media begins to shine the light on illegal mining, then state agencies that, are, that, that have been sleeping all the while wake up and begin to do the job that we're paying them to do, right? Over the last at least few weeks, we've seen a number of arrests. So the question is, could this have been done all this while? Should it take the media to continuously whip people in line, remind them of their job? Well, the Savannah Regional Security Council initiated operations in mining communities along the Black Volta to address illegal miners who have taken over the Black Volta. My colleague Christopher Marco traveled with the security operatives uh, to Bamboy. And let's take a look at what he saw. And uh, we we'll, we'll recall that a bit while Christopher joins us on, on Zoom in a bit. We'll have a conversation on, on this matter. But clearly uh, raising fundamental concerns about what these security 
persons or the regional security council was doing prior to this few weeks that we've been focusing on illegal mining and it's been happening all the while but take a look at this comprised of over 40 personnel from the ghana police service and immigration officers their first port of call was the black water in bamboy the miners on seeing the operations team dived into the water and escaped leaving their machines some also managed to bolt away with their chamfan machines four chamfan machines were seized and set ablaze a motor cane gen sets and other equipment used in their illegal activities were also seized and taken to the bamboy police station the color of the river What you see there is the security agencies, um, as was led by the Regional Security Council, destroying some of the Chamfan machines and also confiscating some generators, generator sets that were seen at the Galamsey site. And well, guess what? This is what we understand uh, from Christopher Marco. This is a Galamsey operation that had been going on for a while. It was just a few days gone by that we have been talking about this continuously as media that um, sort of has gotten them to wake up from their slumber and do the job we're paying them to do. Christopher Amako is a Northern and Savannah Regional Correspondent is joining us on Zoom. Christopher, thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Thank you for having me, Alfred. And, and it's worth starting with a congratulations to you for winning the GJA Best Journalist in the three northern regions of Ghana. Congratulations, you deserve it. It's from the team here to you. Congratulations, Chris. Thank you, Alfred. Good stuff. Now, you, you were there with the, with the security agency, that the personnel there. Now, beyond what we saw on the television, you say that some of these illegal miners were able to escape. How, how, what happened? Yes, so uh, Alfred, you know that uh, the uh, miners were at the other side of the uh, river. And so uh, when we got there, we were at the other end as well. So uh, crossing to go to where they are is a big challenge because the security operatives did not have anything like a boat or uh, they, they just went there on, 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 on motorbikes. And so they could not cross to the other side to uh, arrest or apprehend these uh, illegal miners. They had the opportunity of diving into the river and swimming away. Uh, those that were closer to their uh, chamfan machine uh, had to bolt away with the machines to far away uh, areas on the river. But unfortunately for some of them, they could not move with their chamfan machine. So the security operatives had to swim across uh, Alfred Amase without any life jacket. They had to swim across to go and pick these uh, chamfan machines to the other end, and then they set them ablaze. So, uh, Alfred, um, what I saw yesterday is, uh, is that if we, we really want to fight this, then we have to provide the necessary uh, equipment or we have to equip the security agencies to also be able to do uh, this because the operation was on the water bodies and so there should be some equipment like a boat uh, where they can chase uh, after these uh, miners so that uh, they could arrest or confiscate some of their equipment they use in this operation but all in all Alfred I must say that um, the level of devastation is, is serious it's very, very serious because uh, Hita to what we were hearing from this part of the country is that it's happening in the southern part of the country. And so um, it wasn't closer to us. But after what I saw yesterday, it tells uh, all of us that the uh, devastation on our water bodies is, is just closer to us. And uh, I'm happy that this uh, security agencies have taken this up. But we just hope that this doesn't become a one day uh, wonder. At least so, that's in the minds of many people. And uh, uh, Chris, is this just the area you, you do know, based on your own reports as a journalist there, that this illegal mining is taking place? Just the, the, the Black Volta area? Yes, the Black Volta area, uh, Bamboy. If you go to the Bole area, the Black Volta runs through 
several communities. You go to the, uh, if you are going to Dollar Power, uh, there is a community called Interesu. So the river flows through that area, through to uh, Bamboy, then it links the, uh, the, the, the Bupe stretch of the uh, river. And so uh, the Bam it's not far from the Bamboy community, but you go to the level of impunity, uh, on illegal mining activities on that river is, is very serious. No one is talking. And yesterday we had to walk like for, uh, more than six kilometers to get to where they are uh, in the bush because we didn't want to use the same routes that they used. Uh, we got there and they were on the river uh, 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 do, going about their mining activities. After there were over 50 chamfer machines on that river and we were able to only uh, uh, get four to burn, and so uh, they and, are. And where did the other forty-six go? If you just so, got four. So when they saw us, uh, those that were on their machines, they started the machines and they started going because you know we cannot. The security could not chase them on the river, and so once we were at this particular stretch, they moved to uh, other parts of the uh, river, and so. Uh, the security are saying that the next time they are going, they will not go to where we went to the other time. They will move to a different area to 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 see if they will get them to arrest them. So that is exactly what is happening. How many? You go to that area. The only thing you hear is noise of chamfer machines. You don't hear anything. Noise all over from every angle. And it's important you make the point that this shouldn't be a nine-day wonder because this this had been going on all the while. Before yes, the media decided to, to to talk about this just a few days ago, right? Yes, it's been going on all along, and you know, Alfred. The funny thing is that uh, majority of the people there, because yesterday, from the language they were speaking, uh, meant that they weren't uh, from this part of the country, and so uh, it, it clearly shows that uh, it's something that the people come from other places and uh, the engage in this activity while our traditional authorities and other people that are supposed to ensure that we get uh, these people out of the uh, river bodies look on now yesterday we saw a lot of fishermen also there so the question is that also these fishermen see these miners what do they do, do they report uh, who do they report to why are they not taking action on uh, the miners. So, uh, Alfred, this is something that it's, 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 it involves everybody, but someone somewhere must take the lead and uh, and take responsibility. And that means that government must take responsibility and as well uh, uh, tax uh, the regional security councils, just as we are seeing, to ensure that they don't just do it for the cameras. They don't just do it because someone has asked someone to go and do it. But they should do it because we are fighting it. Chris, thank you so much for this. And uh, I know you're on the beat on this one. So we'll definitely be connected with you some more in the coming days. Congratulations to you once again from the Group CEO Management and Savia and Media General. Great stuff. Uh, the best journalist, GJA, for the Northern Savannah and Northeast regions, correct? Correct, Alfred. You and deserve thank it. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your night. That's Christopher Marco right there. Uh, this is your election command center. But, but uh, we also got information that some four persons were arrested um, a few days ago. And we're going to put that on the screen right now. Four individuals have been arrested uh, for allegedly engaging in illegal mining, commonly known as Galamse, in the Subri Forest Reserve in the Western region. The suspects, aged between 23 and 40 years, were identified as Emmanuel Dawusu, Shadrach, Yosin, Inusa, Yusif, and Issa Seidu. They are currently in police custody. Well, guess what? Well, all these agencies, state agencies, are waking up to do what is expected of them in clamping down illegal mining has been going on in the full glare of the public all the while. Well, we'll continue to do our job in, in waking them out of their slumber. But coming up next year on Ghana Tonight, the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission is concerned about the viability of the Electricity Company of Ghana. Now, the details that they put out in a statement, we'll, we'll, we'll get on it shortly. But the PRC 
that's the regulator of the energy space and the water space for that matter, the utilities sector in this country. They are saying that Ghana's power sector is under imminent threat due to the financial instability of the electricity company of Ghana. It was a letter that they wrote to the presidency. The PRC wants fiscal discipline and a direct barring of the ECG from engaging in non-core activities. They say the ECG is engaging in all sorts of activities. That's not really their core duty. And they want them to be checked in terms of their financial and discipline. That's essentially what the PRC is saying. And let's just look at it. After making all of these, uh, the diagnosis of the ECG's problems, they make recommendations as to what is happening in other countries where a state agency like ECG is also operating, right? They, they talk about Kenya. And Anam we see the seventh is going to be joining us in a bit for a conversation on this matter. According to the PRC, in Kenya, Kenya Power and Lighting Company is listed approximately 50% of its equity on the stock exchange, raising non-tariff funding for critical investment. So these are the comparative solutions from the sub-region, right? So they want, for instance, this to be considered a public-private partnership to deal with this. And in Tanzania, the Tanzania Electricity Supply Company Limited, that's TANESCO, the Tanzanian government converted a government on land loan of 2.4 trillion Tanzanian shillings into equity. Since 2022, Tanesco has consistently declared profits, reducing both technical and non technical losses to around 9%. Think about it 9% as of June 2024. The last time we checked, guess what? ECG is losing so much, as much as uh, almost 70%. What they say is that they lose a chunk of the electricity that they supply. They don't, they don't get the money's worth. So people, they, they do it down to power theft and technical issues that led to the, the loss of power for that matter. And so they're, they're running into losses together with all the inefficiencies that they are engaged in. Also, apart from Tanzania, they cite what's happening in Uganda. Guess what? The Uganda Umeme concession involve the private sector in metering, billing, and collection of services, resulting in a collection of a rate of 98.7%. Now, we see the seven as executive director of the Institute for Energy Security has been talking about this for quite a while. And now, I do appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. First off, with these recommendations that PRC makes of what is happening in, in other parts of the, of the sub-region, is it one to consider to turn around the fortunes of ECG. Good evening once again, Alfred, and to your viewers. Yes, I think that uh, the PRC has uh, churned out uh, very vital information, uh, collecting data and uh, doing their own analysis from countries within our own uh, continent. I think that um, generally they are trying to project a private sector participation into the efforts of the ECG, something that we've been calling for for many years. And um, you know, we lost out on opportunity uh, to nail this once and for all. Uh, when you remember very well, uh, Alfred, the ECG PDS board arrangement, that is a concessionary arrangement that could have potentially address some of ECG's financial and operational challenges. The plan uh, within the, that arrangement was uh, to bring private, private sector participation uh, into the affairs of ECG to improve efficiency, reduce uh, losses, and inject fresh capital into the entity. Okay. It's very necessary that from time to time we leverage on the, the private sector because they don't only bring in expertise, but then they bring the needed funding uh, to uh, show up the operations of these critical entities. Uh, for UCG, that period arrangement was also going to introduce some expertise in metering, billing, and management. Uh, but unfortunately, um, Greek and uh, you know some some form of shady arrangement is what let us in looking that very critical funding and arrangement. But I think we can go back and look at it. 
I see that you sh you recommend that the PDS arrangement should be reconsidered. Of course, all possible forms of private sector participation can be considered, but then we must do um, we must reassess the situation again because right. we have worsened since we introduced the PDS UCG arrangement, mm. and so we should reassess it and make sure that we take the right uh, you know risk assessment of the situation and prefer solutions to that. We see. don't we don't we don't we don't throw away that arrangement. It's something that we can consider, Alfred. Well, the ECG has lost the metal to be able to solve its own problems? The evidence is clear that we showed ourselves uh, and that probably we need something new to uh, uh, show up the operations of ECG. But we must not only be looking outside the country. When we speak of private sector participation, most of the time people are thinking of foreigners going to bring in uh, that, that funding and expertise. But when we look within our own uh, Ghanaian show, we've seen we've seen people Ghanaians who have managed assets very well. You can see even the very staff themselves they've been able to manage both thermal and hydro assets for many years without challenges. I think mm. we have capacity as Ghanaians, so we should look within even when we talk about private sector participation. We should start within. Well, Nana, and I do appreciate your time, and you can understand why people are a bit jittery when they talk about private sector participation in ECG because of the PDS experience and all the nightmare we were, we were left with. But Nana Mwesi the seventh is the executive director of the Institute for Energy Security. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, after this quick break, we get into uh, an issue that has gone viral. I'm sure a number of you have seen that video of a senior high school teacher who was... Uh, pelted with stones and beaten by some students who say he did not allow them to copy in the exam hall. We'll be back shortly after this quick break on this. Just of Christian Methodist Senior High School, we used to call it Krimeto, um, in, in uh, New Aplaku in the Greater Accra region, have allegedly been attacked and stoned by some students of the school. Now, the teachers say they were attacked because they did not allow the students to cheat during the West African Senior Secondary Certificate Examination that was yesterday. So guess what? The video you're seeing there are the students, angry students, just chasing the teachers and pelting them with stones and, and sachet water bags. Uh, and the teachers had to run for their dear lives. It's worrying to say the least. And this is not the first time we've seen this. Um, in some previous instances, this, during the same WASI, we, uh, in the Bright Senior High School in the Eastern region, we saw similar instances. And so th this, is, this is really reminding, especially those who have been watching this space about what exactly is, is going on. And this is here in the Great Accra region. And, um, well, that's Crimeto students you see there. And, uh, well, the, 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 the gentleman we are circling in the red circle, that's the teacher, uh, Walter Yesuto Adanunyo. He just, just unfortunately had to just run for his dear life. Guess what? Walter Yesuto Adanunyo is joining us on Zoom right now. Walter, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Um, really, we, we bear with you in the ordeal and what we saw in that video. But, but tell us, what, what exactly happened? Actually, in the video, the, especially the visual art students, completed um, their WASI exam uh, on 16th, which is Monday, and uh, the paper was um, integrated science. After the uh, general science, we were, we were after the, the paper was, was taken out of the school, I was in the school with my HOD. He also invigilated. And then the one of the students came back. She was going home. And then when she reached the gate and saw the mob there, she came back and came to tell him that the students say that they would have to hurt me 
me in particular, Walter in particular, because uh, I've actually not done anything to them, but they believe they have to hate me. I am too strict in the exam room. That is what they think uh, they want to do. So when the girl came to tell us, we called a uh, headmaster, Asita Headmaster Academics. We called him, and then he he also called the police patrol team. So they came, they came around, and then they came to sack those students in the school, those who were on the on the compound, because after then, all the papers were taken away from the compound, and then uh, we, we were done with the day's business, so nobody was supposed to be in school. Steady. And they were at the gate. The same way, the yesterday the police were not around. They said they were at um, the uh, the demonstration where the demonstration took place. So they they didn't come. So the boys, the area guys, were the people who shielded us. And then they were taking us to the roadside again. Then these school boys threw water, pure water, at them. So the moment the, the pure water hit them, they got annoyed. And then they went back, chasing the boys. Then I told them that, oh, they should leave them and let's go. So they left them. And then when we were going, they started throwing stones at them. That was the last straw that broke the camel's back. They went back, looking for anybody in school uniform to beat. I don't know whether they, cut, they caught somebody, but they went after them, ran after them. And then... When they ran after them, we were left alone. The teachers were left alone. We were three permanent teachers and two service personnel. So we, I told them that, okay, so since the attention is there, let's try and go. Not knowing some of the students, because they are many than us, used other routes. And then they, they met us halfway the journey to the roadside. That was when they started that eh, I am I am straight in exam room. I don't want anybody to copy. Why will I, will I not allow them to cheat in the exam room? You can plainly say that, see that the target was me because they, they voiced it out. There were other other people who were uh, passing uh, by uh, with and, cars, and, I say, and they stopped. Yeah. To find well, Sad one, Walter. And the video we're seeing, so clearly this was an ambush, sort of, the way you're describing it. So have any of the students been arrested as yet? So I learned uh, police came around and picked four of them. I don't know if they were the people uh, in my statement, which I gave at the police station. <laughs> I doubt. But I wrote their names. If you want me to give their names to you, I can give their names to you off head. They are students, I thought, about six of them. Well, and um, I know you, as you have gone to report this to the police, and obviously you, you know them, you say they are your students, so you could identify them when you're saying four of them have been picked up. It's one that will stay the steam on uh, to see what happens next. Uh, but I, I thank you uh, for even getting the strength to speak to us. Walter Yesuto Adanunyo is the teacher at the Christian Methodist Senior High School, who unfortunately was at the receiving end of some indiscipline on the part of the students who say he did not allow them to cheat in the exam hall yesterday during the ongoing WASI paper that they wrote yesterday. That's troubling.